My name is Janine Purse, I'm the speaker of the German Young Cardiologists and I have the great pleasure to have an interview with Professor Patrick C. Royce, who is a um, professor of interventional cardiology at Erasmus University and who is the head of the interventional department at the Thorax Center in Rotterdam. Thank you very much for agreeing to this, to this interview. Welcome. Professor Sirois, uh, preparing for this interview, I read that you started with philosophy. Can you just briefly tell us what led you from philosophy into medicine, into cardiology, and especially into interventional cardiology? Yeah, it's very simple. I mean, uh, as a student, uh, uh, I want to become a philosopher. I want to start philosophy. Mm -hmm. uh, my father was in Africa, so I sent them a letter and I said I want to start the philosophy, pure philosophy, in, uh, in Louvain, in Leuven. And then he was wide, he said, that's fine, but you are a good student, so do something else. I don't mind engineer, doctors, lawyers. And then I, take, I took medicine because I had a feeling that maybe psychiatry, medicine will be a good combination. But very quickly I discovered that uh, philosophy at the university is really boring. And then I went full, uh, full time in, in medicine and in physiology. And why did you choose interventional cardiology later on? Uh, first you select cardiology and then you select interventional mm -hmm. cardiology. And uh, in Leuven I work in the lab of physiology with Professor Aubert on, on the force velocity of the muscle. So I was a, a physiologist on the muscle. I went to Plymouth to work with uh, Sir John Hodgkin, the uh, uh, Nobel Prize on the voltage clamp. And then when I came in medicine, I wanted to have something moving like the muscle. Mm -hmm. So I went in cardiology because that was close to what I've done on the sartorius of the, of the frog. Mm -hmm. And then uh, in cardiology, I became uh, um, work in the cat lab. And then naturally, when Grunzig came in 1977, uh, immediately we, see the, we saw the beauty of becoming a, a therapeutist. I mean, somebody treating the patient and not only doing the diagnose. So in 77, 78 was the beginning of the intervention. And we were lucky to be at the right time and uh, the right moment, yeah. Okay, I understand. And who was your most influential teacher or mentor? Oh, it's very easy to answer. It's uh, Paul Huguenot's, okay. uh, which is a giant in the uh, uh, European cardiology. I mean, and you always say that you see far on the shoulder of a giant. I mean, uh, he's the guy who basically make the European Congress uh, permanent. And he was a great guy because uh, he was, uh, he gave me self-confidence. Uh, he was always positive, extreme freedom in action, freedom of action, and finally nothing was impossible. So with the, these three components, he was really a great mentor. And speaking of your career, what was your most important achievement? Oh, certainly it's the moment I uh, start to do, uh, uh, to introduce stenting. I mean, I was basically uh, um, in the first five in the world after Jacques Puel and uh, Sigward, uh, and then uh, one of my achievements, if we can call that, is to make a randomized trial that was the Benistan from Belgium, Netherlands, and uh, that was in the New England, that became positive, we get the approval of the FDA with these data, and still today it's the, the most quoted paper in, in cardiology with 4,000 quotations and so and then from the bare metal stand, I introduced the drug eluting with uh, Eduardo Souza, the FIM and so, and then more recently, that's the three phase, the biodegradable uh, since uh, March 2006, and I'm still busy to uh, see all the pro and contra of the biodegradable stand, yeah. And a similar question, what was your most emotional moment during your career? Uh, it's, it's very simple, I mean, the, I, no hesitation. The most emotional moment was the first streptokinase I see. I mean, that I will never believe, I ne never forget that. I could not believe, but I will never forget. I mean, the, the fact that you have a, an occlude coronary artery, you have a, a sweaty, anxious patient, uh, you start to infuse the streptokinase, suddenly you see the blood flow coming back, the ST disappearing, the patient becoming again less anxious. That was really the, the biggest uh, emotion in my life in cardiology, yeah, certainly. And 
And how did you manage to keep the balance between research and practice? There is no balance. There is no balance between uh, clinical work, research, family, uh, writing, traveling. Uh, there is no, no balance. But I have a, a, a great discipline of uh, work. I had always. So initially, the first decade, I was working until one o'clock in the hospital. Then at a certain point, my wife said, that's it. And then I decided to bring the fellow at home. So from at 8 o'clock, we were starting to work with the fellow until uh, 11, Saturday and Sunday. And I'm still doing that. You can ask all my fellow in the world. It is every day, every day, every day. I exchange. Every day is a different fellow. And then the writing is very easy because it's a kind of dialogue, a very uh, easy dialogue, yeah. So, I think you don't have so much time outside medicine, but if you have some time, how, what, how do you relax outside medicine? Yeah, I mean, for me, uh, tennis is the only thing uh, short and intense with the fellow. Uh, then, uh, when they are sweating and after a glass of beer, I really hear, heard about, uh, hear what's happening in the department and what they would like to do. And then, uh, I have a great family, so if, uh, there was a tradition to do around the world every year because I had uh, a meeting in, uh, in Hawaii since 1986 and for 20 years we went around the world and during that time I was uh, reconnecting with uh, my children. Uh, they are now 40, 38 and 29, the all great guys. I don't think I was a good father but uh, when did we discussed that they say that I was a good father. I don't remember that. But did they follow you into medicine, your no, children? No, that's uh, something I, I try many times to convince them and I said, no, Dad, it's really crazy with, when I see you working all the day. Uh, so one, uh, my daughter is, uh, is a very good criminologist, uh, psychologist, is a kind of Judy Foster. You remember the movie, The sure. Silence of the Lambs? It's really uh, like she is. Uh, the second is a great guy, uh, expert in wine and cheese. So it's uh, business and food. And the third is a very serious uh, uh, historian. And he's a guy who has studied history and writing book and uh, very, very academic around the world, yeah. Interesting mixture. Absolutely, okay. but no doctor. <laughs> no okay. doctors. Back to cardiology, I just wanted to ask you, if you look into the future, um, what are the main or the most promising innovations you see in interventional cardiology? Yeah, it, it's very difficult. On, on one hand, you have these, um, uh, the device, which is uh, very disruptive. I mean, it was disruptive in the coronary artery, is disruptive in the valve, is now disruptive in hypertension. I don't know how far the device will go. It was already disrupt disruptive for heart failure and uh, arrhythmia and uh, AV block and so. So it's amazing that uh, we try for a long time with pills and at a certain moment it's the device which changed the nature of the disease. That's something uh, uh, I think we will keep going and doing that. On the other hand, uh, I've been waiting for a long time about the impact of genetic. And uh, I'm, I'm still fascinated by the story of the Apo Milano. You, you changed the arginine in cysteine and suddenly it became completely different. And uh, again, there is a revival now of the Apo Milano because people have a culture that we flower with the uh, uh, salt flower, etc., etc. So uh, it's, a, it's a bivalent attitude. The device on one hand and then the, the genetic, uh, at some point we should uh, resolve the problem more definitively especially if we can do some uh, genetic implantation of modification. So it's a fascinating future, yeah? Yes, yes. A lot of points. So um, yeah. may I ask you what advices you would give to younger colleagues which are just starting now their career in cardiology? Oh yeah, that's uh, I always said, uh, don't look around you and try to duplicate what the people are currently doing in 2011, that's not the future. The future is the unknown. So you should look in the unknown and then you will have an exciting life. I mean, if, if uh, when, when the angioplasty came, it was the unknown and we decided to go for the unknown. So I think that's important.
Yeah, to look to the unknown. I understand. Is, is I, I keep saying is that if the future is unrealistic, it will remain the future. If the future is realistic, it will be soon the past. So that's my philosophy. Is there anything you would have done differently if you ha would have had a chance? No, I, I ask me uh, frequently the question, and I had multiple choice. I mean, uh, Jean Bronwald in 1982 asked me to join the Peter Van Brigham in 1982. Uh, then I had a possibility to go to uh, Iowa in 86, uh, Geneva, London, and I always stay in, uh, in Rotterdam. The only regret maybe was to go back to uh, Brussels and to do the combination of Brussels Mongodin. But I don't know. I mean, uh, I'm, I'm a practitioner. I'm a research person. I'm not a manager. I hate the managing. I did quite well for, for the people around me, but I don't want to take care of the whole Uh, business department, etc., etc. So it, it's almost. I, I think I have no regret. I, I think I will do basically the same. Yeah. Okay. And just one last question: um, um, How would you like to be remembered by your, your colleagues, by your younger colleagues, and by your colleagues? Okay, that's a very good question. I uh, don't want to be remembered, but I know that I enjoyed the presence, characterized. I know I, I enjoyed the presence of the young people, and I have had, have had more than 100 uh, trainees, and 57 have done a, a PhD thesis. And I would like to be remembered as the person who has helped the people and give them confidence in themselves, like my mentor did. Thank you very much for this interview. Thank you You're very welcome. much.